agency, although most of his time was spent prior to this um, in the intelligence agencies um, as well as uh, in the US military. Um, uh, let me just say that I think um, Sid's academic work is also uh, worth praising. I mean, people always talk about policy, but his academic work is quite good. I'm actually reading a forthcoming book um, about Kim Il-sung where his, uh, his book on Kim Il-sung has been cited uh, quite often. I noticed it was cited by this author much more than my book was cited, <laughs> no, no. but I'm not, I'm not counting citations or anything <laughs> like that. So. Uh, and, um, and then finally, I would like to say that this is, um, this is one of our Korea platform series in the Korea chair, and we are grateful to Samsung Electronics America for their support of the Korea platform at the, at the Korea chair. Um, so Sid, I will give the floor to you. You may use the podium to Great make some know. remarks. Well, thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you, Victor, for that kind introduction. You know, it's an honor to be speaking here today on this uh, particular issue of unification, I know it's, a, it's an issue that uh, for our Republic of Korea friends here, you've grown up your whole lives thinking about virtually, and for those who are, are not Korean who come here via Korean studies, U.S. government work, academic work, journalism, from the very you know, time you encounter the Korea issue, unification of the Korea Peninsula is something we've all given uh, thought through. Personally, having followed this and studied it for a few decades myself, I'm really glad to see that the discussion is moving beyond the abstract and the theoretical various formulae for unification that, when you look back on them, had very little to do with the geopolitical or security realities at the time. Uh, instead, we're in the realm of the concrete, uh, the real. Uh, moving to concrete conceptualization and planning for reality we all know is coming. It's also encouraging to see the shift in the discussion of the economic dimensions of unification, which I know you just covered. The idea that unification need not be feared simply because of some unverifiable and alarmist forecast of potential cost is certainly not a new one. But in this regard, the bold vision and leadership of President Park in declaring uh, that unification is a bonanza or a windfall or a tabak, to keep it easy in the Korean, uh, and that it might bring a bonanza to Korea and the region is certainly an over, overdue, a long overdue and encouraging proclamation and a, a reframing of the unification discussion. Finally, one other encouraging development related to this issue is that there are a few people out there today that question the commitment of the United States to a unified Korean peninsula. There may have been a time when many Koreans thought that the US may have thought, saw some advantage in a divided Korea peninsula, but that's certainly not the case any longer. Our Korean friends realize that unification is indeed a central tenet of our overall Korea policy, and that's what I'd like to speak to today. Uh, by providing a holistic, if brief, overview of our broader Korea Peninsula and regional policy goals, uh, I think we can see how the interaction of our various lines of effort on our current approach to the North Korea issue uh, all come together, and how all this, uh, by extension, therefore, ties to the issue of reunification. So let me start with a broad but brief regional context. In, uh, his, August 13th East-West Center speech on the United States Vision for Asia-Pacific uh, Agreement in Hawaii, Secretary Kerry described how America's security and prosperity are closely and increasingly linked to the Asia-Pacific. An Asia marked by democratic uh, governance, free markets, a rules-based security order, and a respect for human rights is in everybody's interest. First and foremost, for those who make the Asia Pacific their home, and certainly to the United States, which has been and always will be a Pacific nation. It's natural, therefore, that the United States seeks a stable and economically vibrant Asia and is actively involved throughout the region toward that end. And of course, it should come as no surprise then that these broader goals are the very foundation for our Korea policy as well. You know, as we watch these goals materialize 
in, in the Republic of Korea, a vibrant free market democracy, we never lost sight, we never lost sight of the fact that our ultimate goal is of a unified Korea, where all 70 million or so Koreans uh, can enjoy democracy, free markets, a respect for human rights, and dignity. Our efforts in this regard were never designed to stop at the 38th parallel, uh, and nor are they today. In the broadest sense, we see a unified Korea with these goals, democracy, free market economy, prosperity, respect for human rights and dignity, as the natural end state toward which the Korean people, we, and in fact history itself, are heading. That's why the president in comments alongside President Park in April of this year stated that the United States, and this is a quote, the United States supports the Korean people's desire for unification and I, the president, share President Park's vision of a unified Korea that's free from the fear of war, free from nuclear weapons, and where people throughout the peninsula enjoy the political and economic freedoms that exist here, uh, speaking from Seoul, in the South. And as President Park's own Dresden speech made clear, there are plans, strategies, and actions that we must devise and implement today that lay the foundation for and create the conditions conducive to a peaceful path toward those ends. Actions we take today that lead toward a democratic Korean peninsula where everybody can enjoy political freedom and have a voice in their future. Actions we can take today uh, that lead to a Korea peninsula with a vibrant economy where the prosperity enjoyed uh, by people throughout the peninsula contributes to regional and global economic growth and prosperity. Uh, Actions we can take today that contribute to a peaceful Korea unification, free from weapons of mass destruction, a peaceful Korea peninsula, free from weapons of mass destruction, benefit, benefiting regional and global security as well. And then finally, actions we can take today that can lead toward a Korea free of gulags, free of repression, and free of the other cruelties that the UN Commission of Inquiry so well documented. Is this ambitious? Yes. Is it too much to handle, particularly given the importance of denuclearization and stability? I don't think so. Secretary Kerry, in his speech in Hawaii, uh, noted that our efforts to denuclearize North Korea and deter and defend against the nuclear missile threat are important. And he also emphasized our commitment to speak out against the horrific human rights situation in the North. In doing so, the Secretary made clear that denuclearization and improved human rights are not mutually exclusive, contradictory policy objectives. As the leadership of North Korea begins to make the right strategic choices that can bring the peace and prosperity its people deserve, we will see progress on denuclearization. We will see progress on human rights. We will see economic growth and a better standard of living for the North Korea people. The same type of peace and prosperity that we see marks the rest of the region. Again, too difficult, impossible, contrary to the facts on the ground, contrary to the lessons of the last 70 years almost. No, I don't think so at all. I mean, look at the example of Burma. The example of Burma stands proof of what can happen, a transformation that unfolded thanks to a broad strategic decision by its leadership that then translated into a transformation of Burma's relations with the outside world a transformation that unfolded with the international community, with the United States in the lead, with the international community ready to encourage and enable the changes on the ground that we've seen there. Transformation driven by a pragmatic and clear-eyed recognition that democratic and free market societies flourish while authoritarian repressive regimes wither. A transformation that does remain a work in progress a work in process, but that shows the potential for a nation when its leadership makes the right decisions to move down a fundamentally different path that may have seemed beforehand unimaginable, impossible, too hard, too difficult. And as the United States has demonstrated by the speed and agility with which it responded diplomatically to these developments in Burma, the same option is available to the leadership of the DPRK. But until that day comes, 
How do we today move to that future we've identified as our goal? How do we translate this aspirational into practical policy objectives and goals? This is a good segue into a brief discussion of our current North Korea policy. North Korea, the United States remains committed to a peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula through authentic and credible negotiations. Let me emphasize again, we want to resolve denuclearization via negotiations. We're not ideologically opposed to dialogue with North Korea, nor have we placed insurmountable obstacles to negotiations in our insisting that North Korea simply demonstrate a willingness to live up to its international obligations and abide by international norms of behavior. The bar has not been set too high by insisting that denuclearization talks be about denuclearization and that they would progress along the lines of the September 19, 2005 joint statement of the six party talks. Now, of course, talks are not an end unto themselves. They are a means to an end. Talks must lead to a stated purpose, in this case denuclearization, in order to be authentic. Talks must demonstrate a possibility for concrete actions, for concrete progress to be credible. And even as we pursue a path to authentic and credible talks, leading to complete, verifiable, and irre irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, our broader policy goes beyond talks, goes beyond just dialogue, and integrates three major lines of effort, diplomacy, pressure, and deterrence, which I would like to speak to today. Because together, these three lines of effort, diplomacy, pressure, and deterrence, seek to roll back the North Korean nuclear program while countering, deterring, and defending against the threat. Let me start with the latter, uh, deterrence. Uh, I see some representatives of the Republic of Korea military here, active, duty, and retired, who have spent their careers working in the defense of the Republic of Korea. It's good to see you here, General Chung, General Shin. And they will tell you our alliance remains strong. Our US and ROK forces go together on a daily basis, and our counter-provocation planning ensures that Pyongyang clearly knows that as it contemplates its next set of provocations or its next actions, it faces a rock-solid U.S. ROK alliance. In response to the North's pursuit of uh, nuclear and missile capabilities, our counter-missile planning, our tailored extended deterrence, stand as concrete examples of our shared commitment to deny North Korean ability to threaten and intimidate the Republic of Korea through its pursuit of these capabilities. And in the face of outlandish rhetorical threats and posturing, our firm yet calm responses, firm yet calm responses coupled with our seamless and transparent USROK cooperation remain the foundation of our success in denying North Korea the benefits of its provocative behavior and attempts at coercive diplomacy. Deterrence is working. Security is ensured. On pressure, it's important to know our sanctions are not designed to hurt the North Korean people. They are designed instead for a number of purposes that contribute to peace and stability on the peninsula. Uh, our sanctions are a key element of our efforts to constrain the growth of the North's WMD program, to curtail its proliferation activities worldwide, and by impeding the exports and repatriation of profits from illicit sales abroad, we're able to deny North Korea the resources it needs to sustain and advance its nuclear and missile programs by inflicting an economic and diplomatic cost for behavior that clearly runs counter to international norms and DPRK's own international obligations. We also sharpen the DPRK's choices and lead the leadership in Pyongyang to make better choices that will benefit its country and its people. We also make clear that Pyongyang's aspirations for improving its economy and uh, improving the livelihood of its people are fundamentally inconsistent with this pursuit of nuclear weapons. Thereby moving forward, we will continue to seek robust implementation of UN Security Council resolutions and US sanctions on North Korea. If the DPRK makes the right choice, returns to the negotiating table, and embarks on a credible path of irreversible denuclearization, 
and begins to come into compliance with its international obligations and commitments, the appropriateness of these sanctions would, of course, be reviewed. But with our ultimate goal being denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula through peaceful means, we continue to believe that a dual-track approach, dialogue as possible, pressure as necessary, is the best path to authentic and credible negotiations. Which brings us to the role of diplomacy. And the question that I'm sure many of you have, how do we get DPRK, how do we get North Korea back on the denuclearization path? First, let me say that we believe the six-party talks framework has provided and continues to provide a useful platform for diplomacy. It has, over the past several years, helped us bring uh, a consensus to the need for North Korea to return to a credible path of denuclearization, and we'll continue to use this framework moving forward. We've built a strong international consensus on the need for North Korea to denuclearize. We strengthen cooperation with the other four parties uh, within that framework. And most importantly, we've maintained five-party commitment and consensus on the September 19, 2005 joint statement as the bedrock framework for a path toward denuclearization that in return would bring a range of diplomatic, economic, and security benefits to the DPRK. With the September 19th statement, there is remarkable clarity to the expectations of the DPRK in terms of denuclearization and the potential benefits to Pyongyang should it choose this path. And of course, the United States for the past five years has demonstrated a willingness to engage North Korea. We did so with Ambassador Bosworth's trip to Pyongyang in December 2009 after the events earlier that year of a Taepodong launch and a nuclear test. With a process that began in 2011, after the Chunanam and the Yunpyong shelling. Uh, with a process that led to the February 29, 2012 understanding, which uh, was shortly thereafter walked away from by the North. And of course, with our contacts through the New York Channel. Our policy is not one of not talking for the sake of not talking if you can handle the triple negative. <laughs> we have been and will continue to be willing to engage Pyongyang. Engage Pyongyang to probe its intentions, to push and urge it to make the right decision by presenting to the leadership an alternative path, and to prove, to prove our sincere commitment to improve USDPRK relations once North Korea begins to move down the path of denuclearization. But clearly, the ball is in Pyongyang's court. So of course, one can see how this three-pillared approach, deterrence, pressure, diplomacy, uh, also contributes to creating the types of conditions favorable to the future we all envision and we're all talking about here today, a unified Korea Peninsula that's free of war, free of nuclear weapons, and just plain free. We engage in diplomacy to seek a breakthrough on denuclearization and to ensure that the international community speaks with one voice and that Pyongyang hears one voice, telling Pyongyang that the peace, security, and prosperity it seeks remain possible, but only once the leadership makes the decision to move down the path of denuclearization. We can use pressure as needed to constrain those aspects of North Korea behavior that are destabilizing and detrimental to our goal of laying the groundwork for peace, prosperity, and security that enables unification down the road. And then finally, until we get to that day, we will seek to ensure a safe Korean Peninsula through deterrence, looking for the day when the threat posed on the peninsula no longer exists. We will speak out on the human rights issue as we look toward the day when Koreans throughout the peninsula enjoy the same political and economic freedoms now enjoyed in the Republic of Korea, to the day when human rights are guaranteed, to the day when political prison camps are emptied. And we stand ready, as President Park also has made quite clear, we stand ready to engage with the denuclearizing North Korea to help its leadership move the country down a different path in which ultimately a transformed DPRK can begin to join in and enjoy the dynamic prosperity that marks the rest of the region. The conversations you're having here today uh, look forward to a process we all hope 
a unification process we all hope will unfold in the not too distant future. The mere fact that we are here today reflects our shared understanding, and by our I mean including that of US official policy, our shared understanding that planning for this day, as you, you're doing here today, is a task that we can not put off. We simply cannot afford to wait. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sid, for a, a very helpful statement of what our policy is and what US aspirations are uh, for the peninsula. Um, um, Dr. Seil has time for a couple of questions before he has to go back to work in his new office. Um, so uh, uh, please, we'll, we'll open the floor to a couple of questions and then please identify yourself and be brief and yeah. ask a question. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello, um, my name is Mitch Michniowski and I'm a student at the Elliott School. <clears throat> um, you know, we, we talked that the leadership um, in Pyongyang is irrational and that it does things that are counter to its interests, but um, what I think we could all agree on is that Pyongyang works to protect itself. Um, in the 1990s, uh, the country of Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons for a security agreement with uh, Russia and the United States uh, to protect it in the event of an attack. Uh, since then, one of them has attacked Ukraine and the other one has failed to protect it. Um, given that, do you think that North Korea, uh, in protecting its own interest, has any intention or can see any credibility in an agreement from the U.S. or, by that extent, to six-party talks? Thank you very much. Well, that's an excellent question, but uh, I think it's one, really, that you would have to uh, ask the leadership of Pyongyang. But let me say that you know, the, the framework of the six-party talks uh, approach to denuclearization and why uh, we have sought for the past several years, uh, going back to the previous administration, to, to pursue a multilateral approach is because the type of environment in which North Korea could move forward uh, confident of, of its, uh, its sovereignty is respected, its interests are, are reflected, that uh, nobody teams up or bullies it, uh, is found in the six-party talks process. You have the major surrounding powers, uh, uh, all the relevant parties there at the table. It provides, aside from the question of, of security guarantees and what might be generated through the process, the very process itself provides an, an environment that I believe and we believe is conducive to North Korea moving down the path of denuclearization without having fears for its security along the lines of, uh, uh, you know, the example you provided. Uh, Dr. Green, bring a mic up to the front. Um, so thank you for coming and congratulations on your new job and you're the right man for the job. and. Um, and I don't know what you did wrong to get it, because <laughs> it's going to be hard, but I think all of us who follow this issue have great confidence uh, in the fact you're there and the presentation you gave. Um, it was a good speech, and I agree with all of it. The only thing I would say is Victor Char or Michael Green could have given that speech in 2006 <laughs> in the Bush administration, and since then, things have happened. Um, nuclear tests and a North Korean uh, change to the Constitution and declaration that they are a nuclear weapon state. Um, so. How is the administration explaining that piece of it? I, we want to get back on the path of denuclearization. Six party talks to the right framework. But what do we do about the cheating and proliferation that has occurred since the six party talks were last uh, meeting? Uh, Michael, that's an excellent question. I, this is why I, I put this emphasis on the three pillars because the, they, they do, they're mutually complementary. Uh, they, taken to concerns the realities of the difficulties we're facing uh, in terms of getting authentic and credible negotiations restarted at this time, uh, take advantage of, of the, the international uh, consensus in terms of an unacceptability of a nuclear in North Korea and the, and the threat posed by proliferation to build the type of uh, international cooperation necessary to strengthen a uh, counter-proliferation regime to, to limit, it's not perfect, it's not a, you know, uh, a, a, uh, 
a loophole-free system out there, but to limit North Korea's ability to benefit from its illicit activities abroad, its proliferation activities, reduce its benefits. And also, in terms of, of taking the actions necessary in terms of our military posture, our military training, our missile defense capabilities, so that we counter the threat to whatever degree it's developed. So it's, it's prophylactic in terms of, of uh, trying to counter the threat that's emerged. And so we will continue to try to seek a negotiated uh, settlement to this issue. We will continue to apply the pressure necessary so that the leadership in Pyongyang realizes that its true security and prosperity will only come when it walks away from, not when it you know, holds on to uh, these capabilities. And in the meantime, uh, take the actions necessary for the defense of the United States, the defense of the Republic of Korea, the defense of Japan, and, and defense of others, uh, many, many uh, who are threatened by these uh, capabilities as they develop. Right. Um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to close the floor. I'm sorry. But let me just ask you one question before right. I do as <coughs> the prerogative of the chair. And so as you know, Sid, the, you know, the news story today about North Korea, about these three Americans that are detained there, um, can you tell us what the U.S. administration is doing to get these folks out and uh, whether the prospects of that are very likely at this moment? Well, you know, it goes without saying, but it's, it's worth repeating that, you know, the top priority of the United States government is the safety, safety of our citizens abroad. And it's, uh, we have three cases there that have been ongoing for some time. We have uh, worked to secure the release of, of all three through... Uh, uh, New York Channel, through the Swedes, and uh, you know, I think you would appreciate, uh, uh, and I think everybody here would appreciate that, the, the sensitive details of our negotiations uh, and our efforts uh, aren't really going to be played out through sure. this room, but uh, y you know, the, uh, these three cases have, have uh, posed a significant obstacle to an improvement of U.S. DPRK relations, and we hope that uh, North Korea would act uh, in, a, in a humane and uh, right way in helping us resolve these in the near future. Right. Well, um, I think on behalf of everyone here, we want to thank you for joining us today, allowing us to be part of your coming out party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we know you have to get back to work, so thanks very much. Great. Really thank appreciate you, it. Thank you. Thank you so much.